morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm in California, so it's still morning here. Um, thanks for joining. I'm happy to see everybody is here, excited to present this idea of mobility, meaning commercial vehicles, to everybody. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Gregory Skinner. I work for a company called Escalant. Um, my role there is a VP of Strategic Insights. Just to give you a little bit more info, Escalant is a global advisory and consulting concern. We have offices around the world. Uh, we work in all different verticals. My specialty is in the automotive and commercial vehicle space. Um, I've been doing this for quite a while. I've actually been doing it for over a couple of decades at this point. So I'd like to think I'm pretty versed at this, although we always keep learning and we always keep searching for new information, um, but have been at it for quite a bit of time. What I specialize in is advanced product planning and voice of the customer. And that means two things. The first thing that means is we're essentially talking about the future. So advanced product planning is anywhere from, let's say, three to five years from now and the ramp up to that. And voice of the customer, which is very important when it comes to commercial vehicles uh, of any type, is on the ground. So being there talking with, understanding what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis with customers. And I think this is essential and highly important because a lot of these things that I go to, whether it be a conference or a meeting or anything else, we often hear people talking about uh, these visions of the future, which are fantastic. They need to happen. But as we know in the commercial vehicle space, it's a day-to-day -day grind. You know, we're talking about dollars and cents we're talking about real problems and issues that people face. We talk about goals and things that people are people and companies are trying to implement. So being there is more important than talking about what's coming up in the future. Because at some point, those two things need to intersect. And that's my job, is to uncover that point of intersection and get people from point A to point B. All right. Um, I want to talk about this idea of mobility. So it's funny because when Catherine and team showed up and they said, hey, this, you know, for this conference, we're going to explore this idea of mobility. Of course, the question comes up, well, what does that mean? You know, mobility is one of those nebulous terms that people often throw around. Um, and it doesn't, it used to mean something. Mobility used to mean like, hey, we're, you know, it's sort of an advanced way of getting around some things of the future. We used to think like shuttles and spaceships and drones and all that sort of stuff. Um, but now mobility is kind of been generified. So I went and did a little bit of digging to see if I could come up with a definition that made sense, at least for this application. So for, for, this, for this talk. And this one wasn't too bad. This one's from eltis.org. It says, the potential for movement and the ability to get from one place to another using one or more modes of transportation to meet daily needs. So... I mean, the good thing about this definition is it's applicable to everything, goods, services, people, you know, products, animals, you name it, it, it applies. Um, when we typically use this definition, it's applied to or it's conceived of as people. So let's say we all went online right now and searched this. The first thing that's going to pop up is probably someone getting into an Uber, you know? So, hey, guess what? They, you know, they're walking, they get into a car, they maybe take some public transportation at some point, they grab an Uber and they go from point A to point B. It doesn't have to be that. I think we need to think of the mobility in a much broader sense. And the more important thing here is this idea of using one or more modes of transportation to meet daily needs. So we'll see as I, as I go through this and we start to apply this to commercial vehicles, we're gonna get into this idea of things like multimodal transportation or multi-use or different ways of thinking about getting things from one way, one place to another. Because as you, we'll again start to see, you know, we're sort of linear in the way that we think about, about transportation in the commercial vehicle space or getting people and tools and stuff from one place to another. So we need to broaden that definition. Now, commercial vehicles, you know, especially work trucks in particular, are their own discrete thing. And we know within commercial vehicles, you know, when we're talking class 2B all the way to class 8, 
everything has a specific use case. So nothing applies globally or universally, and it, it shouldn't. But the best way to think about mobility, at least in this context, and then we'll go and sort of extrapolate that or apply that to commercial vehicles, is in the context of delivery. It's the easiest way to understand it and the easiest way to sort of build out the idea. So let's think about it. Let's talk about it today in terms of last mile. Last mile is another one of those terms that's been sort of generified. So if you go, hey, what does last mile mean? Well, it can mean anything. You know, it could be, uh, you know, the Amazon truck that shows up at your door, which is the one that everybody thinks of. It could be your, your mailman. You know what? Technically, the mail guy or mail gal, that's last mile, right? Taking something from, from a distribution center and delivering it to your hands or to your doorstep. So another good definition here is from Business Insider. It says last mile delivery, a product's journey from the warehouse shelf to the back of a truck to a customer doorstep. Now, I personally don't like using definitions from other people. So we went to our constituents in our market and asked them, we said, how do you define last mile? And they said things like, uh, from the start of the journey to the very end, or I'm delivering something to the person or to their door getting the delivery to the customer. Or the last one was, you know, when the part or the package goes directly to the customer. But the idea here is we're talking about a termination point. You know, whether it's coming from a DC or a warehouse or, you know, from, from a store, it's the last journey from that point to the end point. So that's what we're talking about today is delivery, last mile delivery. Now, the thing about last mile so when I actually just finished doing a big investigation, not an investigation, sort of exploration and market modeling of this whole last mile thing. And, you know, it's a super tough market. We don't think about it because you just click, you know, get on your computer, click around, you order some stuff, it shows up at your door. But for companies who are in this space, it is cutthroat. It is a brutal environment. It's super highly competitive. And where did this come from? Well, whether we're talking B2B or B2C customers, you know, everybody has been impacted by this notion of online ordering of goods and services. And probably everybody in this audience today is experiencing that now. You know, so COVID has exacerbated this. We were sort of into it before where you get online and you order something and all sorts of things happen instantaneously. But what's happened is in this from the people who are delivering this product or delivering this service, it's been affected by what we're calling this sort of cult of impatience. So people get on there and all of a sudden their expectations change. So what Last Mile has done is people now expect or companies now expect guaranteed fast delivery, or in this case, it might be guaranteed arrival of a tech or a service guy. You know, they expect the appearance of that person to be at a certain level. Um, you know, if someone's showing up grimy or grubby, that's not going to cut it. They expect people to look professional. And, you know, even when I, again, when I talk to people in the commercial vehicle space, they know this. They say, when my guys or gals show up, they need to look professional. There's an image that we're trying to uphold. And it's important because when they're customer facing, people respond to that. Uh, other expectations, additional services. So not only are you going to come do what you say you're going to do, you might do something else. So it might be white glove service, like you might assemble something when you arrive. Or I was talking to a uh, company the other day, and they were saying, not only are we delivering packages, but now we're thinking about stopping and making other stops that the at locations the customer has something ordered, picking that up for them and delivering both of those things at the same time. Late deliveries. So on the other side, on the customer side, what you're seeing is things like people are rejecting entire loads because they're late. Horror stories like, hey, the load was six minutes late. You know, my guy got caught in traffic and the customer refused to take the entire load. And it was 500 cases or 500 boxes of whatever. You know, customers get angry. Customers get unruly when things don't arrive on time. So my favorite quote here, it's not my favorite for a bad reason, but the favorite quote that sort of jumped out at me was, it's turning our customers into highly demanding monsters. And that's a market reality. So to be competitive in this space, everybody's going all in. You know, uh, 
And they say customer service is our number one priority. So they're prioritizing customer service for two key reasons. The first one is it gives you a competitive advantage. That one's pretty straightforward. But the thing is, it's at such a finite level, like it's knife edge, that that's where it gets really tough. So you talk to a company and they're saying, if my shipment or my delivery gets there even two minutes faster than the next guy's delivery, that's an advantage for us. You know, I can't imagine a time when we think back in the day, assuming everybody on this on this call is old enough to remember, we used to order stuff and it would be days, if not weeks, that things would arrive. And you had no idea when it was showing up at your doorstep. Remember the comic books? You'd order something out of the back of a comic book and then you'd just wait for a month or two and it would, maybe it would show up. Well, those days are gone. Now, if it's not here like a, a minute or two faster than the next guy, then there's a problem. The next thing is um, customers want exactly what they ordered. They want it as soon as they need it. And if they don't get it, they're going to look elsewhere. Suffice it to say, it's, a again, a pretty tough environment from the, from the company side or from the enterprise side. So they're looking for every single advantage they can get. Customer demands, so then on the customer side, demands are skyrocketing. It's everything that I just talked about earlier, which is I want my stuff on time. And guess what? Zero issues. If there's a problem, I'm calling customer service. I'm returning stuff. There better not be any issues. It needs to be here when I want it. Um, we talked earlier about you know being late might equal load rejection. So those are high stakes. You know if you've got a dry van or a 53 footer or something like that, and you're delivering a load of thousands of pieces, and someone's turning you away or making you your guy wait for hours because now they're out of the queue. That's dollars and cents. And nobody needs that. Nobody wants that. It's uh, reinforcing this idea of impatience. So I thought it was just, you know, regular people. But more and more businesses that I talk to, they're saying, you know what? Our customers, what they do at home, they're bringing to work. And now they're impatient at work. And they want what they want now. And then it's sort of, again, created this environment where on demand is at the norm. Really funny sort of side note example, and I always give it. Um, I was ordering some stuff on Amazon. It was super late night, just goofing around, you know, found some stuff I wanted. And I went to click, you know, you go, you click the button and it says, it tells you when it's going to be delivered. And it said, if you click this button within the next like 53 minutes, this shipment will be at your door between 7 and 10 a.m. Like, let's think about that for one second. So it was going to deliver something to me hours later from wherever. How hard is it for a company to pick that product, like identify the product, pick it, stage it, load it, and then get it to my door hours later? That's incredible. It's incredible for me. It's a nightmare for a company to be able to do that. But that is now the norm. So it's tough. All right. Let's talk about this in the context of vehicles. So what does all this mean with vehicles? Well, it's the same deal. Knowing that that's the environment that companies are working in, now vehicles are, are chosen and have been optimized to meet that need. So vehicle selection is approaching maximum optimization and efficiency. Given the powertrains that we see in the marketplace, given the config of the vehicles and the outfit, everything is being optimized to the nth degree, because that efficiency is what creates dollars and cents. You'll select a vehicle based on the application. So is it, you know, do I need a 26 footer? Do I need a transit connect? You know, do I need, um, do I need a tractor? Pick and choose based on what you need. And tip, well, up until a little while ago, these vehicles weren't available, but now they're becoming more vehicle. You'll pick and choose by powertrain. Uh, fuel type. Am I getting diesel? Am I running CNG? You know, uh, am I running gas? You know, again, I mean, city, highway, all these things are available. Location specific. I'll, I'll hear things like, hey, I'm running a Transit Connect or a, a, a ProMaster City because entrance height into garages are low. 
My guys and gals need to be able to have high maneuverability. They're in the city, but that's all available. Load specific. There was a great example. I was talking to a um, catering company and they were running a class A tractor. They do these huge events and they load it up with all sorts of booze. It was in, it was in uh, Nevada. And so, but what would happen is they would park that thing on site and then whoever was there, like their crew would have to basically create this little mini warehouse in, in the back of the uh, trailer and move all the booze around to get it to uh, people at the table. But again, so that's a load specific application, but they made it work. And then of course there's load size. So is one truck doing everything? Do we have multiple trucks or vehicles doing multiple different things? All of that stuff available. But what's happened is, oops, I'm gonna slide missing. What's happened is, even though all of this stuff has been optimized, now all of a sudden there's a marketplace that has is creating all sorts of different demands. So you know, we're calling it a storm, it's coming, but guess what? It's actually already here. So what's a company to do? You know, they look at their guys or okay. Guys, gals, they're stressed. I talk to these companies. They say, you know what? If my com- if my my person is out there and they're all of a sudden behind because of a traffic jam or because they got stopped for a DOT thing or whatever, now they have to make that time up. You know, now now they're stressed and we're stressed, and we have to figure out a solution. We get things like restrictions. So whether we're talking Port of Long Beach, you know, whether we're talking um city centers all of a sudden cities are saying hey you know what there's too much density there's too much traffic so we're going to start restricting who's allowed down here and then when they come down here they're going to have to pay they're going to have to pay more we have a labor shortage we already know this finding drivers finding techs all that it's incredibly hard right now it's incredibly difficult to find talented capable people who want to work at specific jobs even though there's a big pool, it's hard to get them. And then rules and regs, right? Especially in California where we are, all we hear are rules and regulations around vehicles, vehicles that are going to be, let's say, outlawed or restricted or banned, uh, new technology that's going to be uh, enforced, all of that sort of thing can make it really hard for a company. And then there's this idea of the cost. So regardless of all of these other things, from the company perspective, there's associated costs. So whether we're changing, uh, you know, whether we're altering or changing the business model, it's going to cost us money. So let me give you an example. I'm talking to a company the other day, talking to a guy I know quite well. He's saying, hey, guess what? We wanted to improve our, we wanted to improve our profitability and our operational efficiency. So we thought, let's go to paperless billing. Makes sense, right? That makes perfect sense. Less paper, less clutter, less things to deal with. Everything's online, accessible. So they started throwing some money at building a a paperless billing system and a good amount of cash too. Now here's the thing. So they implemented the system, they started to roll it out and they kept paper as a backup. Now, the benefit of having the paper as a backup is that there's always an invoice, there's always a manifest or a document for every single delivery, every single route, every single transaction. If the system goes down, then whoever the driver is or the delivery person is, they can always access that piece of paper, know where they need to go, get it signed off on, which is essential in case there's a refund or there's a problem. So paper is a good thing. So they had this sort of redundant system and then they sent their, sent their people out and said, okay, we're going to do it. Well, what's the first thing that happened? They wanted to use barcodes, which is great. But then they also, what that means is they had to implement a scanning system and a system that understood the codes and of course, assign the routes and stuff based on the codes. On the back end, though, the customer, customers started rejecting load. They said, you know what? We can't deal with this. We don't have a way to integrate paperless billing, paperless billing into our accounting system. We're used to paper. That's what our people deal with. You know, our people don't want to deal with all this new technology. 
um, uh, we don't have a system to scan codes on our end so that when you drop a load that uh, that we can implement in, sorry that we can take that inventory and or take that product and put it into our inventory. And so basically they said, we're not willing to change. So here you have this one company who's invested tens and tens of thousands into a paperless billing system. And then you have all their customers who are saying, we're not willing to change. And guess what they did? They mothballed the whole thing. That whole thing went sideways and they had to park it. And now they're back to paper until they can figure out a solution or until the market starts to catch up to them. So suffice it to say, there's a lot going on right now when it comes to, at least in this context, you know, delivery systems and what it takes to change. Why am I talking about all this? Because when we talk about mobility, it's going to take a fundamental change to get people to a fundamental change in mindset to get people to move from where they currently are. We tend to think of things, and I mentioned this at the beginning, in a very sort of linear way. So here you've got, you know, a beverage truck. Time, you know, it's been time tested over time. It works. It's a great system. But what happens if we sort of look at it a different way? What happens if we sort of turn the model on its axis a little bit and say, yeah, we've always done it this way, but is there a better, more efficient way to do it? Because again, the way that we tend to think about commercial vehicles is sort of one vehicle for multiple uses, as many uses as we can, can find for it or that it can handle. But if we can find a better way to get multiple modes of transportation to handle something that isn't onerous and isn't expensive and maybe makes sense, then why wouldn't we start to think about adopting that? So. You know, we fall prey to this idea that typically commercial vehicles look like one thing or they behave one certain way. You know, whether it be a Transit 250 or an MT55, we always think, oh, that's the that's the vehicle that delivers packages, or that's a vehicle that carries, you know, if it's a plumbing operation, they're carrying pipes and tools, electrical, whatever, like one way of thinking about things. But maybe we think about it a different way. So how might mobility live in a future commercial vehicle space? That's the question. Well, the first way is, and these are just examples, but this idea of expandable and contractible fleets is starting to gain a little bit of momentum. You know, so right now, again, this, now we're not just talking delivery. Now we're just talking fleets, commercial vehicle fleets in general. You'll have a fleet. Um, you know, you might have a little bit of wiggle room depending on how big your operation is, where you have some extra vehicles available in case you know demand or load sort of goes over, and that's what. And then you make sure that everybody is scheduled according to whatever the demands are. You don't want to go over because then you're going to run out of people or run out of vehicles. But now more and more what we're hearing is this idea that why can't my commercial vehicle fleet expand or contract depending on my workload or demand? So in the most sort of archaic way, what we see is a company might say, over the summertime, we have more customers. You know, we have more things happening. So we're going to expand our fleet. We're going to lease a few extra vehicles for the next six months. And then we're going to get rid of them because otherwise they're going to be idle. But what, what you see on the right of this screen is uh, piggy cars. It's just an example. You know, I've seen them rolling around down here in California. Um, and the, I'm sure there's other, plenty of other business models that sort of support that same idea. But the idea here is uh, short term. I don't even want to say they're lease. They're between a short term and a middle term lease or a rental. Piggy Cars is sort of this uh, intermediary. You know, they're an online company and they're an intermediary between a car rental company or a car truck rental company and the customer. And so what you can do is it's a subscription service as everything is these days, right? You get a glass of water, it's a subscription service. But anyways, you, you, know, you subscribe to Piggy Cars, you pay this little down payment and then you go online and you figure out what commercial vehicle you want. So I was just on there this morning 
you know, I can rent a 20, 26 foot box truck for three grand. They'll go to a dealer or they'll go to a car rental company like enterprise or whatever, you know, make sure that vehicle is available. And then you go pick it up and now you have it for the month. You're responsible for maintaining it. You're responsible for taking care of it and you can cancel your contract at any time. Well, that's kind of interesting and that's kind of neat, right? Because now all of a sudden your feet can grow or contract depending on what's going on in the market and what it is that you need. Now, before you jump on me, I know when it comes to commercial vehicles and it comes to work trucks in particular, yeah, it's not that simple. I get it. You know, these trucks are up fit to carry people and tools and product and materials. So yeah, you don't just go to a car dealer and then pick up a truck and, you know, put it in a service. Yeah, I totally get it. But maybe, you know, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, maybe on the upfit side, there's a way that we can start to think about more flexible interiors or more flexible applications where if you do have an intermediary like piggy cars and you do have a vehicle that's been upfit where it can fit multiple roles, all of a sudden that does start to fit into your commercial vehicle needs more appropriately. But again, right now we're not really thinking that way, right? Well, maybe it's time we did. Another example. So I was talking earlier about last mile and we have this thing called the Amazon effect, which is people, again, have huge expectations because Amazon has been so incredibly efficient and effective of getting products and services to people. And for companies big and small, that's a bad thing. If you're not Amazon, it's, you know, it's a tough go. You're just trying to survive and you're just trying to be competitive. But on the flip side, you know, that pressure has been driving a lot of innovation and evolution in the industry. And not just from the delivery side, like from the commercial vehicle side too. It's gotten people thinking really differently about well, how do we use our vehicles? What vehicles do we need? What is it that they should be able to do? So for better or for worse, you know, Amazon's changing the industry. Let's think a little bit about one of the things that they've created that you know fit into this idea of mobility. So it's Amazon lockers. Well, essentially what this is is a micro distribution center. You know, we or even better. You can call it a nano distribution center because it's so incredibly small. I'm talking to some companies and they're saying, you know what, we're building distribution centers and warehouses halfway into our routes because it makes it easier for us to and more efficient for us to get product and material to our customers. Well, this is exactly the same thing. Imagine now if you had these sort of micro warehouses or nano distribution centers, and instead of having to send you know, big vehicles in to get the, to do the delivery. Now, all of a sudden you can have smaller vehicles go in there because they don't have to carry as much or customers are responsible for, you know, coming and picking up their own things. Like that sort of thinking is, isn't widespread, but it's starting to make more and more sense. So now from a vehicle perspective, the use cases change and the vehicle needs change. Now, all of a sudden you don't need the 26 foot box truck. Maybe you can get away with the you know, again, sort of a Transit 250 or a pickup truck or something that's configured a little bit differently. And I don't want you to think that it's just deliveries. This also applies to work trucks. Like maybe, you know, maybe the truck doesn't have to carry as much stuff because you yourself own this little micro warehouse and then the guys go and pick up the things that they need versus having to carry all of the things that they need. That's a bit of a switch in sort of mindset behind vehicle use and application. I talked earlier about this idea of multimodal options. This is, this is another one. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. There's no way my guy's going to be carrying a welder on a scooter. And they probably shouldn't. It's incredibly dangerous for everybody involved. And no, they shouldn't. But the, what we're talking about here is multimodal. So instead of having one truck doing one thing, why can't we have different modes of transportation that are either part of the vehicle or are available to that person to get the job done. What you see in on the left is that dude is DoorDash. He's a DoorDash guy. I don't know if he's in New York or not, but last time I was in New York, 
all I saw were DoorDash, Uber Eats guys on scooters, you know, electric skateboards, uh, bicycles. Well, guess what? DoorDash is using a model where it's multimodal, right? That's what that is. They're saying, hey, we have a job that needs to get done. We are not picking one type of vehicle to do all jobs. So long as that vehicle can get the job done and accomplished, we're good with it. You know, um, again, same thing with Uber Eats. Now, yes, I get it. A lot of this depends on location, things like urban density. So yeah, if you're in Idaho, nobody's using a scooter. I get it. But if you're in a, a densely uh, dense urban population, maybe all of a sudden, again, vehicle use needs to, or vehicle uh, application needs to change. So what was fascinating here is I was talking to a global, one of the guys I know at a global package delivery company. It doesn't even matter which one. And he was telling me, he goes, you know, the challenge right now is everybody's coming up with all this wow stuff. So, you know, we're talking drones and we're talking this and that. He goes, all that costs money. And what it's doing is pulling away all of our funds away from being truly innovative, being truly efficient. So every time I got a wow a customer, however that might be, that's money that I could have spent on maybe a more efficient engine or more efficient types of tires or more efficient software to help me manage, you know, routing. So his question was, what makes sense outside of the wow factor? Again, sort of in real everyday terms to help me do a better job. Bright Drop is a good example of this, not because of what they've done, but because well, not to take anything away from what they've done. They've done a great job, but because of the way that they're thinking about it, that's what's so good about it. You know, they're starting to think about the evolution and enhancement of typical or traditional form factors to achieve the best result. And not just for them, for everybody, for the company, for their drivers, for the customer. So assuming everybody knows what Bright Drop is, or assuming you, you need a little bit more info, you know, they've gone and they've come up with these new electric vehicles for again, urban populations. Um, they've gone and figured out how do we do the outfit where it's the most efficient way to store things and have people access the, the, the contents. And then they've got things like these, we'll call them like electric, electric dollies, I guess is probably the best way to talk about it, to help move packages more efficiently inside the delivery or drop area. That whole idea of, and this is where multimodal really comes into it, right? Now you've basically got two, if not three versions of transportation here. You've got your vehicle, it's been electrified. You've got this electrified dolly. You've got your guys walking. Now we're talking three modes of transportation instead of one mode of transportation. I was talking to someone who is in the electrical, the EV field, and he was saying, you know what, at this point, not specifically around EVs, but around different ways of thinking, you're either ahead of the curve or you're behind it. If you're not already thinking about the future and what we can do differently, then you're behind the curve. So what's it going to take to make all this possible? I know there's a lot of ideas here, but when we're talking about coming up with new ways of thinking about mobility, what's it going to take? Well, the first one is this idea of millennials. Why am I talking about millennials? Well, commercial vehicle space, fleet space, um, a lot of people have been around. A long time and that is great and that should happen uh, there's so much knowledge and wisdom in the people in this space already that nothing is happening without those people millennials are important because they're again that sort of transition point between let's say boomers and gen z so they're familiar with technology they're comfortable with it they want to do things and accomplish things and they're very flexible and adaptable to new ways of thinking. And that's what it's going to take to sort of move the industry forward. Because you know why? Right now, things are working. It's 
sometimes not great, but they're still working. So the question always comes up, why would we change? Why would we do something different if what's working, you know, if what we have now is working? Because every time I try and change, it costs me money, things break down, everybody's trying to throw tech at me, it doesn't work. Okay, well, millennials have that sort of ability to dance between those two worlds. And that's part B. You know, they say things like this. My dream board's full of all these great ideas and innovation, but if the workforce isn't there, then the work doesn't get done. What's that mean? It means they're pragmatic and practical. They're saying, hey, guess what? Um, I know you've got all these great ideas, but at the end of the day, we still got to do the work. But on the other hand, they're also saying it's time for us to sort of embrace the information and technology that's available to us. It's time for us to push the business forward and come up with new ways of thinking and new ways of doing things. So not only are we talking millennials, we're also talking people who have these sort of new, more progressive attitudes about what's possible and what should be happening within the context of business. The third thing that, that needs to happen is technology. I know I was just talking about, hey, you know, tech can be a good or a bad thing. It's really just about the right amount of technology. I was just actually at the ATA conference, the American Trucking Association conference in San Diego yesterday, day before. Um, it's been on for a few days. And someone made this perfect quote. They said, you know what? There's such a thing as too much technology and it's coming at us too fast. And I'm not surprised to hear that because we have a lot of software companies, a lot of tech companies are saying, we have all these great ideas, but you can't force feed a baby. You know what I mean? Like you, the, a person's got to eat at the, at what they're capable of. So it's possible to have too much technology, but we need to accept and understand that technology is what right now we've hit a ceiling. I talked about this and we sort of optimize everything. Technology is what gets us to the next level. So we realize companies are in an awkward position where they have to choose between investing and daily op or investing in daily operations versus status quo. But the investment has to be made. The acknowledgement is, and this is a quote from, you know, from one operation, if you grow, it might cost you another 20 grand because you got to have maintenance, you got to support, you got to have consultants to help implement things. But that 20 grand is going to pay back over time. This is the last, last one. I say the best one for last. But the thing that's probably really going to take this idea of mobility in the commercial vehicle space to a whole other level is the Upbit. So right now, you know, we kind of think about Upbit in, in the context of optimizing or building the most efficient vehicle for the work environment or context, is it, or sorry, maximizing load and maximizing the efficiency of that load and what the person is carrying in the current context. But maybe we need to change that. Like maybe we need to start to think about different elements that align with the work environment or the context. So what you're looking at from an image perspective is, you know, got the guy, whatever, he's just delivering boxes. I guess he's delivering boxes. He looks like a DHL guy, but maybe that maybe he's a tech or maybe he's a service guy and he's unloading all his stuff in his truck. Well, next to that, we have the Moffitt, you have the, the, the forklift, right? You always see these on the backs of the flatbed trailers and they're either pulling like uh, sod off the back or bricks or stone. Well, guess what? That's multimodal. Basically, you have a tractor, it's pulling a flatbed and on the back of that, you've got a motorized forklift. That's what multimodal is. When it comes to Upbit, are we thinking about ways to do that same, like integrate that same sort of idea into the vehicles that exist now? So a conversation I had, you know, we we're talking about warehousing and the guy was saying, yeah, you know, we warehouse all this stuff. And then I send the guys out and they got the truck and we got these motorized forklifts. He goes, I got one, two of those things. And they're sitting in the corner collecting dust. They never get used. People use the regular forklifts, like the hand, the hand jacks or the dollies, but they never use the motorized one. Well, it's because the application is wrong. If nobody's using it, then the, it probably just does, simply does not fit that application. Nobody wants to work too hard. Nobody wants to hurt themselves. Everyone's the easiest way. 
So that means that application is wrong. But imagine if, you know, in the commercial vehicle space, we're, we were thinking about how do we make this vehicle more effective? Is there a way to integrate multimodal ways into that vehicle so that the person isn't hurting their back? Or it's easier for them to get things on and off the truck or move things around or be able to see things. You know, that's why that little segue thing is there. And I just decided to push the example as far as I could. Imagine if instead of having to lug stuff or walk, you know, long distances with heavy things, there's a way to transport that stuff from point A to point B. And it was simple and it could be part of the truck itself or part of the vehicle itself. How much better would that be for everybody involved? You know, the cost doesn't have to be outrageous, but again, it's just sort of a really different way of thinking about mobility in the context of an application or a use case. Um, I know there's going to be a question about, so when it comes to work trucks, what's, what's the one place where people or where we could make the biggest difference? And honestly, it's probably about accessibility. So is there, you know, is there a way that we can change the vehicles or adapt the vehicles where it, again, it's sort of easy for people to have good visibility, be at what's on board, be able to get things on and off simply and transport things. Um, because when I speak to outfit companies, they go, you know what, we've got this thing dialed in. We're using, we use very similar formats for upfitting the trucks. People aren't really asking for different things. And don't get me wrong, you know, the same conversations, we talk about new innovations, like new ways of thinking about things or doing things. We're talking about a hand washing system that came out of COVID, like that never existed before, but now that they're carrying things like that on board. So yeah, innovation is happening, but we haven't thought about it in the context of how do we sort of move things and people around in a more efficient way. So what's in store for the future of, you know, when we're talking about mobility, whether it be commercial trucks or any other type of vehicle? The first thing is multimodal. It can't just be one truck doing one thing anymore. Now we need to start thinking about, are there multiple vehicles that we can integrate or devices or form factors we can integrate together to get the job done, where it's not just a big box rolling around carrying stuff inside of it. There needs to be nonlinear ways of thinking. So there's more than one pathway to, to the solution. Have we really started to explore what those different pathways are? and talk about how do we collaborate and start to develop those. The next one is this idea of upfitting flexibility. So again, very efficient, really worked well. But now let's talk about how do we configure interiors and potentially exteriors where there's more flexibility and adaptability depending on the use case and the need. And then the last one is context-dependent applications. There's no one solution. There's no one truck or one vehicle that's going to fit every single need. So how do we apply this idea of different things in one vehicle to fit specific context that that vehicle is going to run through on a day-to-day -day basis? That, my friends, is the end of mobility um, in commercial vehicles. Just a, a really quick thing. The sorts of things that I talked about today are things that we explore in a quarterly basis um, that Escalant that I run called Fleet Foresight. The idea here is we look at the challenges that you know, are happening in fleet and commercial vehicles on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we explore them as a group. We present information that we've gone and found for that quarter. So whether it be last mile delivery, update, you know, infrastructure and talk about how do we start to use this thing more effectively on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, all right, cool. There's one question that came in. I know we're at time, so I'll just answer this one real quick. The question is, people have been talking about mobility for a long time. Uh, how is it different now than it was before? Well, the fundamental difference between now and before is that the technology in the vehicles. Um, I hope I'm on time. Uh, the technology, the vehicles, the support that um, 
that existed before has changed. So, you know, I'm talking about things like electrification, like electric dollies and software that helps support this idea of where is the package or where is the person? Well, five years ago, 10 years ago, that sort of thing was not robust at all. But more and more, we see all these companies entering the marketplace where they're bringing the, these products and these services to bear. You know, they're, uh, they're delivering these new ways of thinking and it's, it's really real. So I think that's sort of the biggest change that we've seen over the last decade or so. Um, uh, that now all these new ways of getting the job done have changed. And now there's more available for, new ways available for people to get the job done. All right, my friends, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this lecture. Hopefully it spurred some thought and some new ways of thinking. If you need to contact me, I know that um, WTS has the info, but here it is for your viewing pleasure. And I look forward to talking to you again some other time.